How much better are the Bengals this year than last year? That's one of the many questions we're set to ask. Mo Egger of ESPN's 1530. Welcome into Cincinnati Bengals talk here on YouTube. Make sure you hit that subscribe button and let's dive in. By the way, you can catch Mo every single day on ESPN 1530, every single weekday, three to six, and on the iHeartRadio app. I'm James Rapine. And uh, Mo, Mo, let's start with the Bengals and, and expectations. Um, I don't think expectations have ever been this high going into a season during my lifetime. You were around for the 88 Super Bowl. You remember that Boomer winning MVP, all of those things. So <laughs> is, is that the last time they were this high or is this different? Is this uncharted territory? I think this is entirely different. I mean, I, I would say 2013, they were pretty high, right? Because they had made the playoffs consecutive years that sort of felt like you know the, the the necessary steps they had to take to legitimately contend and i think a lot of us looked at that roster in 2013 and felt really good but let's be honest we kind of knew in the back of our heads they didn't have an absolute a-lister at quarterback and we knew that then we were holding out hope that well you know maybe andy is going to take the next step and god knows i talked about that a lot uh, we're not wondering that about joe burrow and and I was 11 years old in 1988. Um, and, you know, for me as a kid, as a Bengals fan, I just thought, well, this is how it's supposed to be, right? Like, my team just went to the Super Bowl. This is how it's supposed to go. In 89, though, they had at times an insanely good offense, but just things caught up to them defensively. But yeah, the expectations coming off a of Super Bowl were enormous. And they're enormous now. Um, I don't necessarily remember. Uh, prior to the 89 season, how we were handicapping their chances against the rest of the AFC or at the time, the AFC Central. And we're certainly doing that now. And, and part of what makes this so fun is how loaded the AFC is, how interesting the AFC North is. But certainly as an adult, uh, I can't recall uh, a July, um, you know, an entryway into training camp that has given us the same, the sort of expectations that many of us have this year, even if you go back to like 2006, right? There was trepidation because Carson Palmer was coming off uh, a major knee injury. Any of those years, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, that they made the postseason, all we were talking about was, can they win one stupid playoff game? They've put that behind them. And so now we're talking big picture stuff. We're talking huge expectations. And I think it's a lot of fun, but it's, it's also sort of uncharted territory for most of us. What are your expectations for this team going into this season? Because I, I think me personally, I think it's unfair to say, oh, well, you upgraded the offensive line. Jamar Chase is a year older. Joe Burrow's a year older and he had a healthy offseason. I expect you to win the Super Bowl. I, I think yeah. that that's really tough to put on any team. I, I do too. I, you know, look, we're all going to pick a team that we think is going to win the Super Bowl. That's that's the fun of it. But I, I really have a hard time with the Super Bowl or bust thing. Or if somebody says, you know what, I think the Bills are going to win the whole thing. Okay. It, or, uh, you know, I think Kansas City is going to win the whole thing. I disagree. I, I think they're due for a, a pretty significant step back. But I, I think there's any number of AFC teams that you can make the case could win the Super Bowl. Um, and so I, I don't love planting my flag on they've got to win the Super Bowl or, or the season's a total failure. For me, um, win the AFC North. I think they have the best quarterback in the AFC North. I think you can make a very good argument. They have the best roster in the AFC North. And a lot of what plagued this team in the first half of the season last year went away in the second half. I expect that to continue. You have an ascending quarterback who's coming off an excellent season. You have a coaching staff. And this, this is something that I've talked about a lot this off season. Um, I, I, you know, I, I think Zach Taylor is still growing into the role and I, I think for as masterful as, as he and his coaches were for most of the postseason, there's still some situational things that I think need to be ironed out. And I expect those things to happen. They have a better offensive line. There's great continuity with the coaching staff. There's not a lot of glaring holes on defense. There's really nothing to dislike. You might wish they had a little bit more depth at a certain position, maybe at the three technique. Certainly, I think at the, the middle and, and back into the depth chart at wide receiver, we'll talk a lot about that. I'm sure during training camp, but what is there not to like? And so I actually expect people have talked about them being a candidate for regression because of how lucky they were last year. I've argued they weren't that lucky in the regular season. They were, and correct me if I'm wrong, four and five in games decided by one score or less. Now, yes, things fell their way because they were really healthy and the Ravens were not. And uh, Cleveland had a an, an major injury at quarterback and the Steelers held on to Ben Roethlisberger too long. But I mean, 
were they lucky against the Packers? Were they lucky against the Jets? Uh, were they lucky in in some of those games in the regular season that just stood out as as massively frustrating losses? Um, were they lucky when Joe Burrow at one point led the league in giveaways, which I don't expect them to do this year? So I, I think I think they're actually a candidate for if you know not necessarily to go fourteen and three because of how hard the schedule is and how tough the division is, but I actually think they're a candidate to actually improve upon what they did last year, ascending quarterback, better roster, better offensive line. And if they stay healthy and you can never quantify that, I actually kind of expect them to fare better in closer games than they did last season. It's an interesting point about Zach Taylor, uh, because the, during his first two seasons, and obviously there were a lot of losses in general, but there were a lot of one score losses and that mm -hmm. became a stat. And you're right. Last year, it was the same thing. Another game, the 49ers game, right. It was just such a yeah. ugly game for him down the stretch. And that's another area where I think one, we can just fairly evaluate him now because mm -hmm. I can't imagine having this Ferrari and Joe Burrow, especially coming off of the knee. And then you're, you're battling for the postseason mm -hmm. and you're trying to, to not just save your job, but do something that hadn't been done in quite some time here in Cincinnati and mm -hmm. do it with an offensive line like that one and having to scheme around that. So that's what I'm intrigued by is the, the, the balance of that one. He's got better personnel. Two, mm -hmm. he's gotten better every single year uh, as a head coach, I think. And so situationally, does that improve as well? And if so, that's that's kind of the part where, man, if he takes another jump as a head coach and as a play caller, that I don't think many people are talking about from a, a growth standpoint for this team and where they can get better. Yeah, people do get better at their jobs. I don't. But people, uh, by and large, do get better at their jobs. And, and you know, look, I mean, I, I can yell and scream – um, and have uh, most of the offseason about, you know, Samaj P. Ryan third and one at Aaron Donald. OK, situationally, oh. anecdotally, I hated that. But, you know, you talk about scheming around that offensive line. That's not easy to do, man. And, yeah, we give Joe Burrow a lot of credit for not turning the ball over and for showing great toughness. When they sat down for all of those opponents to prepare for all of those opponents, they had to design game plans around a massive deficiency, and not just a slight weakness, a massive deficiency that's not easy to do I, I thought the, the the job that Lou Anarumo did against Derrick Henry and then in the second half against Patrick Mahomes in an overtime a master class and in just changing schemes and uh, uh, adapting to the opponent and adapting adapt, adapting to what's happening um, within a game and and look you know we've you and I both have been critical of of some of the things that Zach Taylor uh, oversaw and did in the first two years but like I, you know, most of that he's proven to get right. Like we like the leadership, the culture part of it that he talks so much about seems to be really good right now. And some diminish the role of coaching in the uh, development of Joe Burrow, have a decent level week one, year one with no preseason and the weirdest off season of all time. Like I, I think all of that reflects coaching. And so the, the macro stuff, I think Zach's done a really nice job. The staff has done a really nice job. Now it's the micro, right? So that game against San Francisco, Burrow leads you on this epic comeback and then you take the ball out of his hands. We're going to put a, a larger microscope on stuff like that this season. Or let's just say they're in a similar position to the one they were in in the Super Bowl, not necessarily in the next Super Bowl. But, hey, it's it's third and one. Are, are you going to run your second best back at the best player in the league? When the team stinks, I don't care about stuff like play calling. I'm not interested in what they do on second and seven. Now the team doesn't stink. And so the true difference between, you know, let's say a team that wins the division – or starts the playoffs on the road could be a decision made by the head coach or uh, the, the difference between playing a, a second round game at home or maybe getting a first round season could be a coaching decision. Those things matter so much more right now. And, and I think Zach, by his own admission, would tell you like the, the situational part of it. He's still growing into that role um, with all the other stuff kind of taken care of. It, they've they've cleansed the locker room of dudes who don't want to be here, of guys who weren't on board. It feels like they have the right mix of guys. They're self-led. All that stuff has been taken care of, and Zach deserves a lot of credit for it. Now it's the micro part of it, and I think it's going to be really interesting to see how he and the staff as a whole, uh, with the benefit of continuity, um, get better at their gigs. And if they do, then I think the sky's the limit for this team. Make sure you catch them out every single weekday. 3 to 6 ESPN 1530 in Cincinnati and on the iHeartRadio app. All right, as far as concerns go, 
because you're right. There aren't many weaknesses, but with training camp less than, well, right around two weeks away now, what's your biggest concern about this team going into camp? There's the obvious stuff, right? Like, are they deep enough at wide receiver? Um, I know that's, that's something you're going to talk about a lot, <laughs> Yes, <laughs> but you yes. know, are, are they deep enough? Are they, you know, the, the reality is they missed two games among their main skill guys last year. Right. So year to year, does that repeat itself? If, if the answer is no this season, then, you know, who fills that void? I, I, Odell I'm still of the Jr. belief. Oh, I, I'm still of the belief. The fourth wide receiver for this team is not on the roster right now. I, I just, I, I can't believe that Mike Thomas for all of his uh, contributions on special teams. I just, I find it hard to believe that we're just going to go. Yep. He's the fourth guy. Um, and, and if he is, then, then they've proven me wrong. So, all right. You're a little bit worried about depth there. Um, there was a case for bringing back Larry Ogunjobi once the thing with Chicago fell through and they really haven't addressed that. And so is depth going to catch up to him there because it kind of did in the postseason last year. Those are questions. I think there's a difference between a question and a concern is the offensive line as good as we think, right? Because on paper looks great individually each guy in their prime good pedigree coming from winning situations you love them all but will they mesh to the degree that we like um will they unearth the 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 sort of running game that we only saw very small glimpses of last season And, and then i think there's just a a sense of all right defensively what is this unit right they're they're not an elite defense as and I think they exceeded everybody's expectations last year. And again, look at what they did in the postseason. The Bengals made the Super Bowl in the strength of defense and special teams, and none of us would have guessed that would be the case. Uh, let's say in November, but top to bottom, does does that unit take a major step forward, or collectively is there some sort of regression there? Um, there's going to be a whole lot of young guys that are asked to fill pretty significant roles, especially if the Jesse Bates thing lingers into the regular season. Um, That's sort of a 30,000 foot view of that defense. If you go position by position, I'm not sure there's anything to not like BJ Hill played himself into a, a starter's role that last season. And, and, you know, if everybody's healthy and you get Joseph Osai, that defensive line could be pretty formidable. Logan Wilson looks like the, the first like Bengals linebacker that we've wanted them to like latch on to since Vontez perfect. And I like the pieces in a secondary a hell of a lot more than I did a year ago at this time. But, you know, still, if it's if the ceiling is not elite defense, then the floor isn't that high either. What happens if they come close to that floor? What does that look like? And then I think any, if anything, it's just the overall quality of the AFC. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it's and, and, and not necessarily who they play, but the overall quality of the AFC. This half of the league, the, the NFL is so tilted toward the Bengals half of the league. You expect Baltimore to be significantly better. Obviously, Cleveland's a major question mark. Pittsburgh is still going to be formidable, uh, even though they weren't head-to-head against the Bengals last season. Um, But it's just the overall quality of of that side of the league affords you very small, very little margin for error. But I'll be honest with you. I I look at them, the roster, and I don't know what I'm not supposed to like. Mm -hmm. I I don't know what, what I'm really supposed to lose sleep over. There's just not a lot there. And so really dealing with NFL first world problems. If you start nitpicking this roster, aren't we? Uh, He's Mo Egger. Make sure you check him out on ESPN 1530 every single weekday, three to six and on the iHeartRadio app. 